Presented by The Hockey Shop, source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Check it out today. It's In Goal Radio, the podcast with the co-founders of In Goal Magazine, Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison. I'm Darren Millard. A lot to get to today. Our feature interview with Colin Delia, who was a longtime member of one organization, switched this year, and he'll talk to us about the technical aspects of that transition. It's a very goalie specific conversation. Some of them can be wider and rounder around the edges. This one is highly technical and you are going to love it if you get love to get into the weeds uh, of things. Plus our uh, our gear segment today is going to talk about pad flexes. It's not exactly what you think, but it's pretty cool. Uh, as we uh, bring in the uh, the guys, here's Hutchison and uh, Woodley. Uh, Woodley, uh, what's going on with you, and how is the Seattle Kraken covering of the the Stanley Cup playoffs? Speaking of a little rounded around the edges, boy, life on the road in the playoffs is, uh, you do some good eating when you're down in Seattle to cover cover a playoff series. I may have put on a few pounds down there, so need to pick a hotel that's further from the rink and a longer walk for me to get back and forth. I don't know how the guys that go the full two and a half months covering playoffs survive, because it is not a healthy lifestyle. So, um... But the Seattle Kraken are a healthy franchise. Man, like what a treat for me to get to go down there and cover their home game so far in the first round of the playoffs. Let's see if there's more coming in the second round. We're recording this ahead of game seven between the Kraken and the Avs. And how about Philip Grubauer, boys? Like a guy who has taken a lot of heat since getting to Seattle. Uh, I don't think it was as warranted this season as it was last year, perhaps. And, And last year, it certainly wasn't all on him, but the goalie's struggled behind a team that struggled this year the team's got more structure and here's the thing philip grubar actually had one of the lower expected save percentages in the nhl like for whatever reason at the start of this year whether it was maybe even them having lost a little faith in him from last season as a team as a group and trying to do too much in front of him at times or maybe just getting some kind of the crap sandwiches in terms of the starts he was getting early like he had such a low expected save percentage so tough defensive environment but he outperformed it all year by a significant margin early, a couple dips late. Like he ended up having a good season by the adjusted metrics, certainly better than the 899 save percentage that everybody was pointing to going into the playoffs as a sign of weakness. And he's been even better against the Avs, one of the top first round performers so far. Let's see if he can carry it over into game seven. And I do wonder a little bit how much of that is the familiarity. Um, played for Colorado, obviously, for all those years. It looks like on the power play, there's times where, you know, a goalie's reading things well. Like Grubauer actually looks like he's sitting on some of those backdoor one-timers. Like he knows it's coming. He is there. Like forget before the pass gets there. It looks like he's there before the pass even leaves sometimes. He's just reading the game at such a high level. And then there's been a couple mano a manos with guys like Miko Renton and um, in really good scoring positions where he's keeping that fingers up glove and just holding it there. And Miko sort of shooting it into the glove where I think in a lot of situations that tight, that in close, a lot of goalies are dropping that glove and going into more of a chicken wing or a shoulder. But it's almost like he knows what's coming from Miko Renton. And so I do wonder, you know, how much of this is how much more comfortable Philip Grubauer is right now because it's against a team he knows so well. Well, that's confirmation that uh, Woodley's been paying attention to the series. So that's uh, that's great uh, for NHL.com and for Ingle Mag listeners. It's the only one, though, right? It's the one I'm covering. So everything else, I'll be talking out of my ass for the rest of this segment. Hey, a couple of great performances uh, from guys that are through Ilya Samsonov. Really happy with the, the his play, Hutch. And Jake Ottinger uh, has really uh, just got better throughout the entire series from that double overtime uh, loss to game start where everything was on Philip Gustafson. And he managed to find his rhythm. And the Dallas Stars are through based uh, a lot on the play of Jake Ottinger. So interestingly enough, like uh, I thought Ottinger at the end of this series was the Jake Ottinger we expect, right? Like he was brilliant. Um, Games two and three coming off a five period game in game one in Dallas, a hot environment, even though he may be used to it. I don't think we saw the same level out of him in games two and three. And that's why I actually didn't mind the Minnesota switch because Gustafson gets game two off. Obviously, Marc-Andre Fleury wasn't able to hold up his end of the bargain in that rotation, but Gustafson comes back in game three. He's fresh. He plays well, and I thought Ottinger still looked like a guy who might be, you know, not struggling, but think about it. Like, everyone's like, ah, it's every second day. You can play every second day. Like, they went almost two periods of overtime 
in that heat in Dallas in the first game of the series. Game one, day off. Game three, day off. Or game two, day off. Game three. That's three games in five days. That's doable. But if your first game is damn near two games, that's almost four games in five days. We would never play a goalie four games in five days. And yet we do in the playoffs. And so I don't think we should be surprised that the level that Ottinger is capable of dipped slightly in two and three. And as time went on, he had a chance to recover. We saw it back to what we expect from Jake, which is brilliance. Like he's an incredible young goalie. Games four, five, and 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 the series is over. So, um, you know, there's been a lot of teams advancing with goaltending that at least statistically doesn't jump off the page. Ottinger's the one guy. Like if we're talking like after the first round, what goalies are going to be on the Con Smythe list? Ottinger, Akira Schmidt if it's the Devils, Igor Shishterkin if it's the Rangers. Like it's a pretty short list of sort of goalie driven victories in the first round. Like hey, listen, like like team play matters here and so I but I so that's why I'm a little People be like, oh, you're criticizing Jake Conjure. Not at all. Like he'd be on my list of guys who could by the end of this all win win a con Smythe. I just think you need to look at those first three games of that series coming off a double OT to start it and and sort of maybe evaluate it a little more honestly than a lot of people have when they just ripped into the decision to turn the keys over to Flurry in game two. I suspect that Minnesota realized they wouldn't get the best out of Philip Gustafson at game two. They gave him the day off. And they get the best out of him in game three. Wasn't enough to turn the series, but people that suggest the decision to go away from him was what turned the series, I think is at times a little disingenuous as well. One of the best performances that I've watched was the mental uh, battle that uh, Lauren Bersois faced in Winnipeg in that environment and uh, all the chance and, and everything that was coming towards him. And it just, it was just so stoic and it reminded me of Pete Fry and all the different uh, elements that go through with the mental aspect uh, and uh, and that approach to it. And uh, there's uh, an opportunity to get involved with Pete again, Hutch. There sure is. He's a guy you've heard about a lot here on the podcast and over at ingoalmag.com. There's all sorts of great uh, mental training content at InGoal, thanks to Pete Fry, who's worked with a, a whole host of NHL goaltenders and major junior and college goaltenders. Of course, we saw Dylan Ferguson's debut in the National Hockey League this year, his first start, I should say, not his debut. And Pete was there in the stands uh, watching along. And uh, we are presenting with Pete a one-day Goalie Mindset Pro in-person seminar in Vancouver, uh, as we did last year, uh, repeating that on June the 24th. So we would love people to come and join us uh, on June the 24th in Vancouver, whether you want to work with Pete for the day, maybe hang out and uh, chat with Woody a little bit and find out more about uh, his experience in the game. If you uh, head over to GoalieSeminars.com, you can grab your registration for this one-day event. There will be early bird pricing. So if you get in now, it's uh, just going to be a little bit cheaper than later on down the road. InGoal members, as always, we like to pass on some savings to you. Check out InGoalMag.com this week. You will see a post there that will include for members a link for savings on your registration. I think, Woody, it was going to be 25 bucks uh, off. So that's like half your membership returned to you as you join us for this one day seminar. What's different from last year, people who just paid attention to uh, what we were doing last summer with Pete, uh, you're going to get this full day experience working on your mindset, whether that's confidence, hype level, focus, your routines on the ice, say before a face off, visualization, all sorts of great stuff. What he's added this year is there's a one hour ice time Uh, at the end of the day as well, so that you can take some of the things that you've learned and now rehearse them on the ice and put them into your game. So fantastic one day experience with uh, in goal and with Pete Fry on June the 24th in Vancouver, head over to goalieseminars.com or if you're an in goal member, head to ingoalmag.com so you can get your discount. See, I love segues and Hutch just opened the door for two brilliant segues with that. I'm so brilliant. Tease of Pete's. So we could either go with Stuart Skinner who is a former Pete Fry client, Pete Fry mindset client. Stuart Skinner worked with him and talk about overcoming tough situations with a broken stick in a clinching scenario to give away a goal. Or we could just go with June 24th and the chance to see Pete. Well, you could come a week early. Spend a week in Vancouver. Hit us up at Tendy Fest on June 17th 
in Langley put on by the hockey shop where they will have demo gear from all the major manufacturers. So your chance to actually get on the ice, they have two ice sheets out at the Langley Twinplex, where you'll be able to get out on the ice and try the newest gear, see what works for you, what doesn't. You'll, well, there'll be demonstrations, there'll be equipment, reps will be there to talk to you. Uh, we've got a special guest coming with us. There'll be coaches on hand. Like just Tendy Fest says it all. It's going to be a great day for goaltending. It's out in Langley, put on by the hockey shop. Uh, and Ingle Magazine will be there. That's June 17th. And then a week later, Pete Fry. So I'm thinking like goalie vacation in Vancouver in late June. I know some people are still in school, but ah, whatever. It's just school. Like just come spend the week. Woody. 17th, hang out for us <laughs> for a week. Stick around for the 24th. Nobody's actually teaching in the last week yeah, of June. Exactly. Let's be honest. I'm with you. Like ya. you're watching... You're watching like movies and social studies by that point of the school year. Woody says school is important, but goaltending is importanter. Investing right. in yourself. That's what you're doing. And the teacher wants to know, are you looking forward to the future? Uh, are you paying attention? Yes, you are on the goaltending side of it with the mindset and then the tendy fest combination. It's brilliant. I love it. Maybe you get a couple ice times in there. You, you work it around. You use your connections. Uh, it, it's awesome. Uh, you mentioned uh, Stuart Skinner and being solid between the ears. That was an incredible bounce back and performance by Stuart Skinner in that deciding game against the Los Angeles Kings in which the giveaway leads to a tie game, but it doesn't snowball from there. Well, and I think I've loved his, it's interesting. Let me talk about mindset. And like I said, a former, a former client of Pete Fry. His mindset and his approach throughout this has been great. Like he got pulled in his last game in Los Angeles, right? And Jack Campbell comes in and the next day Skinner's talking to the media. And and by the way, like not every goalie is like we've seen it in a lot of the series, like goalies are just taken away from the media between games, but there's Skinner between games talking about the opportunity to grow from it. Even after he wins and clinches the series, he's talking about still seeing room for growth in his game. This is an entirely new experience for him. Like Skinner got better as the season went on and now all of a sudden everything's new again, like the pressure of the playoffs. And he talks openly about sort of seeing things that he can improve on. And I just I just love his approach. I love his mindset. It's why he's an easy guy to cheer for. Um, it's why even in moments in the first round where he's not at his best, because we've watched him all year and we know what his best can be, and maybe he doesn't quite get to that level in a game, you're confident he's going to find it again and there's no panic. Like there, I just, I just love his approach to everything. And that's why um, even after an up and down, I will say first round and he was brilliant uh, in the, in the closing game, um, especially in that second period where LA was all over them, even amidst those up and downs, I, I you just know that if there's peaks and valleys, like the, on, on a long chart, the, it's that arrow continues to point up. Like he's just continuously getting right. His regular season was like that statistically. Um, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if he builds confidence and strength and improves his play as the playoffs go on, despite getting pulled in one game, despite having a stick break on him and lead to the tying goal in the third period shorthanded. Um, just goes right back out there and goes back to being himself. Doesn't get outside of his framework or his structure he knows what he has to do, and he tends not to panic and, and try and do too much. Also, I want to mention his teammates did a heck of a job in insulating him right after that. Uh, they didn't allow anything uh, the, the rest of the way. So I want to give them the, the big stick taps because we do need our teammates. Uh, unbelievable. He did everything right, Hutch, and it just dissolved with the, with the stick break at the worst time. Like There was nothing he could have done to avoid a catastrophic event, which he didn't see coming. No, nothing at all he could have done. And as you said, it's just an incredible uh, bit of mindset for him that he could hold in there because, I mean, how many times do we, do we see that when you're evaluating a goaltender, what happens when adversity, when adversity strikes? And now there he is in one of the most pressure filled moments of his career, adversity strikes and, and he holds strong. I'd say kudos, by the way, to the Oilers as well, guys, because they actually went back to Stewart. I mean, how many coaches, when yeah. they pull a goaltender, then they get a win with their high-priced goaltender, do that risk-averse thing of just, well, we won with them, so we got to go back to the next game. But no, they 
they uh, went back to Stewart. That's uh, a credit to them. I think it's a credit to what he did for them during the season as well. And uh, and even though this isn't about long term development, this is going to be great for his development as a young goaltender as well. The fact that they went back to him. We should probably give kudos to Jack Campbell too, right? I mean, yeah, after for a sure. really tough first year in Edmonton, he comes into that situation when Skinner gets pulled and. You know, let's be honest, it wasn't always pretty. There was a couple of sort of swim lessons there early in the crease where you wondered if he had any idea where the puck was, but he battled. And I thought he got better as that game went on. Um, made some really tough saves uh, from a, you know, almost from a technical standpoint. Looked as clean as I've seen him in a long time, which tells you he's been doing the work. While well, Skinner's been starting, he's been putting in the work on his game with his goalie coach to make sure in case of glass emergency situation, I'm ready to go. Um, you know, and, and as much as that, it's a six game series, I think you could argue, you think of the breakaway save on Arvidsson. Um, if it's not for Jack Campbell, the Oilers don't have a chance to come back in that game and get that win in LA and a chance to close it out in game six. That would have been a chance to go back to Edmonton. So, um, you know, they both deserve a lot of credit. And usually when you see a goalie that hasn't played a lot, who comes in and looks prepared, the goalie coach also deserves a little bit of credit. So kudos to Dustin Schwartz and his staff for keeping Jack sharp and for both goalies for having the right mindset around uh, this situation in the playoff. And great motivation for all of us. You never know when that big opportunity is going to present itself. In this group, did we have Stuart Skinner against Lauren Brassois in the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs as your goaltending matchup when this puck dropped at the start of the season? No. But both goaltenders seized opportunities middle of the season or later and have made this a reality, Hutch. They have. We're going to get the hometown kid versus the Mm -hmm. former Edmonton Oil King. So that's a a fantastic storyline right there, isn't it? And uh, absolutely, it's about seizing the moment. I don't think at the beginning of the season, everybody saw Jack Campbell as the starter. He's the guy they paid to bring in. And Stewart was just the rookie finding his place in the lineup. and has uh, had a brilliant season to seize the crease. And then uh, how happy are we for Laurent Brassois that he's come back off that double hip surgery and uh, through circumstances that uh, were unfortunate for the other guys involved, he's been given this opportunity. He's been ready and, uh, and has taken advantage. So the, the storylines are fantastic. Awesome stuff. I'm really excited about both guys and what they can do uh, and being able to rise to the, that occasion and, one of them's going to go through to a third round and get more than halfway to a Stanley Cup championship. Uh, you got to be able to bend and mold to your surroundings, which is uh, somewhat uh, of a segue into our gear segment this week, except when it comes to pads, they're so stiff now, you have to mold around them in a way. It's not like the old days. So uh, this week, uh, you at the uh, Hockey Shop and the Gear segment presented by the Hockey Shop, source for Sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. Uh, Cam, dealing with pad flexes, Woody. Well, dealing with guys like me that walk into the store, pull every pad off the wall, quickly grab it by the top of the thigh rise and try and push it down, um, you know, like it's... Uh, uh, what accordion, are they, what are they? accordion. Accordion, accordion. You have pretty strong yeah. to accordion a pad today. Well, that's true, but guys try, right? And so we got into this conversation, and I'm really going to suggest, as, as you listen to this, I'm not going to give it away right now, but this is one where I think you need to head over to YouTube, over to our IGTV, uh, and check out the video, because you're going to sort of, we're going to talk about things that you might need to sort of see to understand completely, um, but the, the idea is simple. Like, we all do that. We walk into a store and we do that, but when does a pad actually, especially on the thigh rise, not the boot, hey, boot flex matters, and your preference for that, you got to test that. But in terms of expecting the thigh rise to bend, when was the last time you dropped into a butterfly and the thigh rise bent? When was the last time it bent that way at all? So the question that I asked Cam in this segment is, are we measuring the flex at the top of the pad the wrong way every time we walk into the store and annoy him by pulling all the pads off the wall and shoving them down to the ground like that? See if he has an answer. Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports. We're out here in Langley, Goalie Utopia, Cam's Corner, 34,000 square Cam's feet crease. of goaltending greatness. Well, we let the players have their corner too, but we've got our little goalie uh, section here, and we're going to talk about pad flex. I think we, scr- we, we scratched the surface on something here, and I think we should, we should definitely kind of go through it a little bit. Why? How many? So let me ask you. We'll start by asking you, Cam. 
How many times do people come into the store, other than me just pull everything off the walls to be annoying, but grab pads off the wall? What's the first thing that goalies do? They grab the top of the pad and they push it down flexi. Remember, we have a podcast too, so you doing it doesn't exactly help. You can kind of hear that, you know, a little bit of it. They're, they're flexing the pad overall. They're taking the top, they're putting their hands on the top of the thigh rise and pushing down. And pushing down. But why? Well, so, then that's the thing. So understand. There is value in figuring out how much flex there is at the boot. There is value in figuring out how much flex there is at the knee. But in terms of flex on the thigh rise, why do we push down on the pad? From what I can gather, and we're talking years and years and years and years ago. We've always done it. Why? Yeah. Well, let's go back to the days when we used to have leather straps on the top of the thigh rise. No, no, but okay. So the point though, before we go back to that may be why, but there's no point. Everyone walks in and sees if that thigh rise will curve and outside of knowing whether there's enough flex to maybe work a break into it, work a curve into it permanently, no pad flexes like that. When you drop into the butterfly, the top of the thigh rise doesn't curve in front of you. This is bringing us back to the old days it did. You could have a, a strap, thigh rise strap. Correct. Sorry. Nobody has that anymore. No, no, because you don't need it anymore. The way the pads rotate and fall in front of you now, you want that pad either to to roll in front and stay rigid and flush on the ice to help seal that five hole. Or if you do say have a little bit of flex, it kind of pushes, say out of the way of your pants a little bit to help that rotation down so, to the butterfly. So we're measure every time we walk into a store and grab a pad off the wall and shove that thigh rise to see how much it'll curve, how much curve, yes, is okay. Can I put a curve in it? We're doing the goalie version of literally kicking tires by flexing a pad like that. It does nothing. It does, that's not how a pad performs. Correct. So what should we be looking for? I mean, obviously these, we've got all these different brands here, different models between brands. There's different flex ability in the top of the thigh rise. Correct. Clearly we don't want a trap door where there's so much flexibility in the top of the thigh rise. I could see maybe pushing down to see if it's so loose that a puck's gonna hit it and open up the five hole. But outside of that, we're not measuring anything that's actually tangible for how we play. No, nope, not at all. So what should we be looking for? Boot flexibility. That's a big starting point as well um, and a big for me big reading point for, for guys especially when you're getting into that stiffer pad or even a saw pad for example if it's a stiffer pad that softer boot's going to help to keep that pad from riding up on you when you're in a reverse vh situation any sort of post movement that's allowing your skate to rotate and get out of the pad a little bit more the stiffer that boot is the more that pad's going to want to kick up on you so i would say for almost most Pads on the wall nowadays, we are talking about someone thinking it is a, yeah, it's a softer boot to start out with anyway. So knee flex, the flex at the knee, because some pads have more than that, so we can be measuring that. A good example would actually be the True PX pad. Very, very stiff up top, but quite a soft break at the knee. So what should we be looking for, though, when it comes to flexibility? I would argue that rather than pushing it down to see how much it's gonna curve in to close the five hole like we used to do, because the reality is, again, unless you're inserting a leather strap to pull it closed when you drop, the pad isn't going to move like that as you go to the ice. Which would create rotational issues, so don't do it anyway. So can, is there something we should look, what about the other way? Not Pads that have flex the other way to move out of our way when we're dropping into the butterfly. Now, a lot of that you've touched on also torsional flex, technically speaking there too as well, because that's very important. And that's starting to really now shift with the way we think about pads as torsional soft versus stiff. Torsional flex is, is a, you mean like twisting. Yes, correct. But that's also what can help to move that pad out of your way when you're dropping down to the butterfly, depending on the goal. But again, it's not curving into you. No. It's whether the thigh rise will give away from you and allow that clearance as you drop into the butterfly, that clearance as you move from your knees, that clearance as you recover from your knees so that the top of the pad isn't hitting and pushing your legs apart. There's some mobility there. It's not hitting your pants and getting caught. That's that flex. The other way is arguably more important than this flex. Once again, you've you scratched the surface of something because we can also talk about how thin the thigh rise is of a pad, which can also affect exactly what you just described as well pad that is thinner up at the top is going to allow that goalie to cross without that same interference as something that was a little bit thicker that would potentially push their pads out and separate the two. 
I, I feel like there needs to be further discussion on this. Yeah, so let us know in the comments below. Why do you flex your pads when you walk into this door? Why do you push down on them? Do you think that thigh rise actually bending in towards you has any value other than, I, like I could see it like, hey, is this so stiff that I'll never be able to work a curve into it? Because some guys like to work a little curve into the top of their thigh rise. So maybe trying to figure that out, I'll grant you. But other than that, are we measuring pad flex wrong? Leave us a comment. Smash that like button. Hit the subscribe button as well. Call Cam with your answers. <laughs> Make sure you get him personally and, and bend his ear for a good half hour. Tell him whether he's right or wrong on this one. What's the number? 604-589-8299 or 1-800-567-7790. That's a really interesting take on, on pad flexes. And a reminder, for more detail, to, for the visual side of it, IGTV, uh, the YouTube channel, for in goal to be able to soak up uh, what the guys were, were talking about with pad flexes. There's nothing wrong with going in uh, and, and pressing down on the pad. I think it's, a, it's sort of a, a rite of passage, but don't base your entire opinion, Woody, on what you do five seconds into the, the store. Yeah, because I think in some ways, and Hutch is the one that made this analogy earlier, it's like walking into the car dealership and kicking the tires and thinking that tells you which one's good. Like there's, there is, and we see, as we explained there, there are elements of it that matter, boot flex, but you know, again, like think about it, is, is it how the thigh rise curves towards you? Now, hey, if we're talking about, I think I can put a break, I want a curve in my thigh rise, will this take a curve if I you know, put it under a bench or whatever to try and get it to sort of pre-curve or, but once you hit the ice, that's not how it bends. And, and more important is whether there's enough flexibility in the top of the thigh rise to move away from your leg so it's not interfering with the patterns of your movement, not hitting the other top of the pad on the other side and causing interference that way. And so just a different way of looking at it, not saying one's right, one's wrong, just you know, a, a, a thought that we wanted to plant in the heads of goalies everywhere as we, we consider pads for the upcoming season this summer. I think there should be an old set of pads from 2010 just standing by that you can walk in and just give a good little push and then get on with your day uh, shopping for the new ones the other piece that comes up on the pad flex is what he's talking about the thigh rise is you remember it wasn't too many years ago the big thing everybody worried about what is my pad weight can i make it lighter can i make it lighter can i make it lighter and the only way you can make it lighter for the most part is to switch from a high density to a low density foam. And I can remember some of the demonstrations we saw, Woody, where you could take the, the thigh rise and it was incredibly flexible because you went to that low density foam. And uh, what does that mean? Well, then, the, then it's too bendy and you start letting in pucks through the wickets in the, uh, when you're down your butterfly. So there's so much to the pad flex situation. And uh, I probably am that guy that goes into the used car store and kicks the tires and just hopes I understand what's going on or try and look cool in the store because I don't know what I'm looking for. But uh, great, great bit there, Woody, to educate all of us. I was trying. Do you actually kick tires when you go into a, a car dealership, Hutch? Like, no, not little, really. Mostly I toe. just, I don't even know what I'm doing in the car dealership. I look online for a good price and talk to Woody because he knows more. He tells I know. Me I was going to say, just hey, Woody. It's like, yeah. Woody's, our, Woody's our car dad. Yeah, our car That's guru. Because, not because I know anything about cars, but because my brother is actually a former mechanic who now teaches mechanics uh, at the local institute of technology. So to create the next generation of mechanics, so I just ask him, get all educated and stuff. I like that <laughs> educated and stuff. School is um, important. Uh, going on to right, the education, going to school for. A mechanics, you, you got to take that uh, next step in your life. Like uh, Craig Anderson, I don't know whether he's going to become a mechanic or whether he he's going to take whether he's going to take a gap year uh, or or what he's going to do. Uh, but uh, but it's a heck of a career. Uh, almost twenty thousand career saves, Woody. Yeah, I mean, heck of a career for Craig Anderson. When we talked about it when we had him on the podcast last time, like I don't think people realize like how big a milestone three hundred wins is, and Craig got there. Um, and then kept playing. Uh, I've talked to you guys about this before. Like, I remember having a conversation going into Craig's final year in Ottawa with him in Florida over lunch. I was there to do some stuff with Luongo and Robbie Tallis on the ice, and Craig was, because they live in Florida, 
Uh, he was the goalie that was uh, there for the for the summer skates. And like, it's a summer skate, like it's an all-star game out there. Like guys like Ovechkin are out there for their summer skates um, at the practice rink for the Panthers. And we went for lunch after. And he told me at the time he thought it was his last year. Um, and here we are. He played four more seasons in the NHL. This time, it seems officially is finally done. And so we forgot to last week, but we wanted to make sure we did it this week. Um, just a congratulations to Craig Anderson on an incredible career. We've gotten into... You know, we talk about getting into the weeds as we're about to with Colin Dealey on the technical side. We've gotten into every aspect of the game with Craig over the years. Uh, he's been on the podcast before. I highly recommend people go back and, and listen to it. You'll actually learn something uh, about what made him so great and the way he reads releases. Um, in losing him at the National Hockey League level, we probably lose one of the greatest, you know, pure readers of a release in the game. And that's that's not me saying that. That's guys that played with him. They couldn't believe how well he read pucks off sticks. And quite often, as he tells us uh, or told us in the past, it's because he wasn't looking at the puck. He wasn't looking at the stick. Um, At practice advice, he gave us, like, if you want to learn how to read a release, uh, go through a practice, not looking at the actual release. Learn how to read hips and hands and eyes and all the other visual tells uh, that players give to you. Work on that in practice, and you'll be better at it in the game like Craig was. So uh, he'll be missed in the NHL. I saw... His wife posted a photo of his son in goal for the first time and Craig on the bench doing a little coaching. So so maybe that's in his future, whether he wants to or not, as uh, maybe he'll stay in the goalie world if his son decides to follow in his footsteps. So we wish him, regardless of what he chooses, whether it's the auto racing side, which he's big into, staying involved in the game, we just wish him the best in in whatever it is because he's... Uh, he's one of the really good guys that we've had a chance to meet and get to know over the years. I love that idea of going through a practice and not looking at the puck, uh, everything else that goes with it. It's a, a slightly nerve wracking idea to be able to really go through with that. But that's where something like Sensorina would come in handy, right? You could be able to put on the headset and watch all of those same things without the... Uh, nervousness of taking one off the mind. You're probably not going to get uh, hit in the bean and get hurt. And of course, we've heard the other side with Sensorina Darren, which is you can put on the headset and only watch the puck and not actually try and make a save because you want to do the read. So whether it's doing the Craig Anderson method of just watching the players and the situation or the uh, Devin Levi method of just watching pucks go by and staying focused on them, uh, Sensorina lets you do things that you simply can't do on the ice. And one of those things is get on the virtual ice every day if you want. It's pretty tough to stop by the local rink and grab 15 or 20 minutes of extra practice each day. But with Sensorina, you can put that headset on and face NHL shooters, uh, all sorts of great situations on the ice and learn to read the game better. Um, now's a great time, guys, to get involved in Sensorina for two reasons. Well, kind of the same reason. They've got a new partnership with USA Hockey, and uh, that means there's some new drills in Sense Arena as a result of uh, that partnership with USA Hockey. There's new training plans uh, from USA Hockey. One, for example, that helps you learn to read the release. All sorts of great new stuff as a result of this partnership, and, and it should be said that Sense Arena does this over and over. They build new relationships. That means an improvement in the Sense Arena software. And you get a better experience. It feels like almost every time you put the headset on, but certainly every few months. As a result of that new partnership with USA Hockey, they've got a fantastic new drill, uh, excuse me, new deal available. If you go grab Sensorina right now and you go for the annual pricing, what was $49 a month, and you'll have to forgive me, the pricing is different in every country based on local currencies, but that's what I'm seeing right now here in Canada. What was $49 a month is now $29 a month for that pro plan. You now can get onto Sense Arena and try it for free for 10 days if you already have an Oculus. You could grab a starter plan that's a little bit cheaper and gives you access to maybe a little bit less content. But now the pro plan for the next little while is actually at that starter price. $350 a year, that's a dollar a day. You can get on the ice with Sense Arena. You'll also get the sleeves that mount those Oculus controllers to your gloves for free. You'll get um, the shipping for free. And as I said, that, that free trial. Also in the pro plan, guys, you get four different user accounts. So you could sign in and train. If your brother or sister is a goaltender, they can use it as well. Mom or dad. 
actually you can sign on and use the player training as well. So maybe maybe one of your siblings is a defenseman and you're a goaltender. You can both use Sensorino with that one $350 a year, a dollar a day account available now because of this great new sponsorship from USA Hockey. And if you use the code IGM50 at checkout, you'll get a further discount on top of this great deal as well. So great time to check out Sensorina, guys. I love it. Uh, honestly, it, it's so good. Yeah, I even lost the cover to my, you know, the part that goes right on your head from the mm-hmm. headset. Uh, it got uh, misplaced the other day. And we had the uh, sweatbands from the mask going okay. in it. My daughter uses it for, for different, uh, the headset for different games. And I use it for... Uh, Sense Arena. We were making do. We were we were like grinding through to use Sense Arena the other day, and uh, and now we've located everything. That's so some serious awesome. mindset there, Dan. Yeah, I know. Serious I know. I grind through it. Uh, the Sense Arena feature interview this week is with Colin Delia. Uh, Woody, uh, tell me the 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 real nuts and bolts of this because it's highly technical. Yeah, we get into like I mean. You know, we've had we've had Ian Clark on, right? Yeah. We've we've had Thatcher Demko on. Like there is a way they play here in Vancouver. They've got a system, a game plan that is somewhat unique and very specific. Like there are there isn't a lot of ambiguity within it. Although he doesn't shove the same thing down every goalie's throat. You'll hear Colin Delia talk about how Yaroslav Halak last year, like Yaro came with bona fides and wasn't trying to make a whole bunch of changes. What he did worked, and so they just maintained it um, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. But for a lot of guys. You know, I remember when Colin arrived in August early for a month, month and a half before training camp to start his work with with Ian Clark and talking about how he had seen Spencer Martin the year before, watched him as a guy that he played against in the American Hockey League for years, watched him play and being like, hey, that's different. That looks like a different goalie. Things have changed. He was having success. And so he wanted to sort of, you know, as he as he was in unrestricted free agency, he looked for an opportunity to sort of to to do that to uh try and make some changes to his game and it's it's not easy um there are significant changes he'll talk about that process of going from trying new things to and he's a guy that likes to feel things to sort of how long it takes to make them innate make it so that the new things are what you go to under pressure rather than reverting to the old and um we dig into the specifics a lot of talk about multi stances uh, adjusting to that, uh, different movement patterns, different post plays, just different ideals, keys on visuals, uh, something they call air to big, rather than when you think about blocking. This is you know just a different mindset, a different philosophy. And so we this one is this one is a technical one. This isn't light and fluffy. Um, Colin does a really great job of explaining a lot of these philosophies, how he integrated them. Um, you know, and 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 in a tough environment, right? Like started the year in the American Hockey League, getting comfortable down there with all the changes, worked with Marco Terranius, uh, the, the goalie coach they brought in, a Finnish goalie coach who had been in the KHL for years, and then graduating to the big club. And yeah, a lot of people look at the hockey DB and be like, oh, like, you know, he had an eight, he was in the eight nineties in save percentage this year. You got to remember that the first half of his time in Vancouver was behind one of the three worst defensive teams in hockey. So Tough to try and add new things. He, This is my words, not Collins. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but pretty tough to add new things and then do it in an environment where there's no predictability in front of you. And, and that was the reality of what he arrived to in Vancouver. And I think as things tightened up and the structure got more predictable after the coaching change here in Vancouver, I think you saw his play improve as well because you know he was able to sort of add these things to his game, but also make the, the reads came easier for all the goalies here. Once the defensemen knew what they were supposed to do and everybody got on the same page. So uh, don't don't sort of judge by the raw numbers this season. I think Cullen made strides and I'll be curious to see what happens. He's an unrestricted free agent this summer. And I I, I would expect that he's going to have offers coming based on some of the conversations with other coaches I've had around the league. It was a conscious step in the career of Colin Delia in the Sense Arena, Sense Arena VR feature interview on Ingold Radio, the podcast. Really excited. Welcome back to the In Goal Radio podcast. Second time guest. Last time we dug into the weeds of growing up in Rancho Cucamonga and becoming a goaltender from California. Now I got to watch him play a little more in my backyard here in Vancouver. Spent the last season with the Vancouver Canucks. Colin Delia, 
back on the podcast, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for making the time so early in the off season. I know I'm disrupting a lot of uh, family life right now, so I appreciate it. No, no, I, I appreciate uh, you having me on. It's always a pleasure. So, how was um, season's over? You're settled back in Chicago. First off, I got to tell all our listeners to make sure they go back and listen to the first time we had you on because we really did get into your roots as a goaltender. But this time, we're going to keep it a little tighter and we're going to focus on the evolution. After five years of the Chicago Blackhawks, your first time switching organizations, you join the Vancouver Canucks, you get Ian Clark as a new voice, you get Marco Terranius as a new voice. What was that adjustment like? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to spend most time digging into a lot of specifics here, but what's it like going to a new team for the first time? Yeah, it's definitely challenging. Um, I think for me too, like I, I obviously never knew anything else. Like you said, I was with the Blackhawks organization for uh, five years, you know, previously and up and down between, you know, the Blackhawks and the Ice Hogs. So, I got to make a lot of like really close personal relationships with, you know, the coaches, training staff, um, strength and conditioning coaches. Like, uh, so it was, it was definitely, definitely a change, but it almost, it it was definitely necessary because I think that my time had run its course there. It was important for me, um, at this point in my career to try something new, you know, um, five years, I think, in in one organization is is a decent amount of time i mean i think a lot of players probably change hands um maybe before that but i I was privileged to spend five years with them and i have nothing but positive things to say but it it was really nice and refreshing to go to different organization and more so from a goaltending standpoint um just get different perspectives and different points of view and ways of ways of operating and conducting ourselves day in and day out, you know, that I think was, uh, the biggest eye opener, you know, is that, you know, it's, it's not the same everywhere with every NHL club, you know, as far as the day to day, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, a, a difference in how each club runs. And that was cool to see in and of itself. Okay. So you get, you, you arrived early for this first time with a new team, and you got in here, like, I remember seeing you at the rink out in early August, uh, working with Ian, working with Marco. Important because it was a new team and you were, you, you, I'm guessing, expected to be introduced to some new concepts based on some of our early conversations. Yeah, most definitely. I think um, I had a bit of a primer with Clarky um, shortly after I signed and I just kind of made the decision. I mean, my wife and I spoke about it, but we decided it was like really important to get there, you know, a decent amount of time ahead and just work as much as we could um, on these principles and just the different philosophy, you know, like there's just so much about the way that Clarkie teaches that it is just so counter to a lot of other goalie coaches um, and at least the way in which he conducts business, you know, and, um, the communication aspect is is very important, I think, in a goalie coach, and he's definitely uh, definitely really good at communicating, um, to say the least. But uh, yeah, I think for me, I had gotten used to playing a specific way for so long, and and just through my talks with Clarky, it almost made me realize like I didn't really have like a specific way I played. I just went out and played, you know, when I had a bunch of different options for specific or non-specific situations you know i just kind of like threw everything out there and was super athletic and you know just try to stop the puck you know but i think in the the beginning phases and all the way through the end you know it was pretty apparent to me that you know i need to have a game plan you know i mean it sounds funny to say but you know pro goalie um not having like a true game plan or like a system you know i kind of i i always like to feel my edges and, and work on work off of that as my foundation and base. But um Garky showed me how to, you know, skate in a different manner, you know, a, a lot uh a lot more thinking, I think, than I had ever really anticipated. You know, so it was important to try and get those reps in um in the summer so that, you know, come season, you know, there's no thinking, just playing out there. 
Okay, so I'm going to throw a line out here that uh, gets me some weird looks sometimes. This is a test of how old I am versus you, Colin, but it's like Top Gun. If you think out oh, there, yeah. you're, you're dead. Yeah, that's Okay, true. so now, now the question is, do you know that from only because of the new one, or do you actually remember the original? No, I've, I've never seen the new one, actually. I only remember the original, so yeah, that, that Score doesn't one for the old guys. Years. Yeah, All right. no, it's, it's true, though. Yeah, I guess it's very tactical, right? Like, you know, to that, that same analogy, like, there's really no time, you know, to think just because the game's gotten so fast and the players are so good that, you know, in the way that Clarky helps me understand the game is that you just have to be great at reading the situations, you know, reading the situations like and just acting, you know, like you've seen them hundreds, thousands of times, you know, just trust the instinct, go out there and play your system. System. The idea of having a game plan, a system, you talked about that, not asking you to give too much away if you're not comfortable with it, but can, can, you, can you give us some examples of like, you know, how that changed in terms of that foundation and having a plan, um, you know, from, from the five years past, like what couple, maybe a couple sure. specifics in there. Yeah, I think, uh, firstly, um, just kind of narrowing the stance up a bit and playing a little bit more um with my feet just outside the width of my shoulders you know and then even having varying stances um based on you know certain you know landmarks like on the ice um or certain situations you know as the puck's getting closer um shot preparation comes to mind as well you know as the shots being taken adjusting from you know, high stance to more medium stance. Um, that was a huge, that was probably one of the first things that I think I was able to make a little progress with, I think, because, you know, you get to practice that, you know, all the time. Um, but then also just post play and, you know, the inside out moves and the rotations, reverse track. Um, those were definitely things that I had not uh, implemented into my game until this year. I kind of, would hit the post and hinge back, you know, and always kind of always like to have that um, connection first with the, with the post. And then also with my, my skate, you know, as the, as the rudder leg, but, you know, which differed um, from how we chose to, uh, you know, play that system with, you know, really rotating super hard and, you know, getting inside out. And um, another thing that we worked on too was uh, alignment. Um, in relationship to the post, like just having more of like, uh, you don't want to be too shallow, you know, but that sub 45 alignment, as I'm sure you may have, um, made note of in previous, uh, podcast or editorials, but yeah, yeah. we've had, we've had that Toronto and done pro reads and I've heard that before. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So I know I'm not saying anything you guys understand, but, uh, this was all foreign to me, you know? So like just to even, tie in what that actually means with how my body was moving and just being able to communicate like it, it was really challenging for me it was something that um you know i was working on all the way up until the end of the season um and then additionally just tracking you know like i was it's it's crazy to say but like for me i was just more of like a very like i trusted just my like my hand eye for chicken wings and blocker gloves, say stuff like that. And it wasn't until like, I started really digging in with Clark. He's like, you don't track the puck well, you know, like at all. So, and it's not like something where you're like overemphasizing, you know, like with, we're taking your whole body out of it. It's just like through your neck. And, you know, he's like, why would you take away your most valuable asset, you know, which is your eyes and, you know, you're handicapping yourself. And, for me, that that's still a big challenge of mine, and that's something that you know I'll be working on a lot here in the summer. It's amazing to, like you said, like five years pro, played in the National Hockey League, and you know something as simple as like we we all hear watch the puck, we hear early eyes, yeah. but are are there instances? Um, maybe you can share an example where a certain situation or where you didn't realize you weren't to the degree you could, or you changed how you were doing it. Yeah, I think the first example that really kind of started like that self-discovery was like i wanted to be so quick and fast all the time but like my head was always like whipping around whipping around you know i was like you don't even like you're fast but you're not even seeing the puck you know it's like 
slow it down, like be more definitive with your eyes. And he's like, your body is going to follow, you know? Um, I can't think back to necessarily a specific situation other than that, but that's the first that comes to mind. You know, he's like, if you're, if you're driving down the Autobahn, you know, and you, you look out the window, he's like, what do you see? And he's like, you see nothing because everything's just a blur. He's like, that's you, you know? So it's like, you know, just be a little bit more definitive, um, you know, with your eyes and separate your head essentially like from your body in the sense of like when you're tracking, like it's just turning your head left, turn your head right, you know, always following the puck. Like that's another thing that I, I really didn't do prior. Like I would try and like get everything. I would try to play like my box control with my hands, like in front of my body. Right. And if it missed my blocker glove and went wide, like I wouldn't actively like turn my head and rotate my whole body like my my fundamental like system and the way that i track pucks going wide was was inappropriate you know so like and it, it really pays dividends when you when you track the puck like all the way even if it's like behind the net you know you just have like eyes on and like you're already ahead of the play and i think that kind of alludes to another point is like everything that we did and that i learned was with the hope that you would be ahead of every play you know, so you're buying time, you know, and when you're buying time and you're ahead of every play, you can, you know, start with like, as he says before, like a full toolbox, you know, everything at your disposal, whereas if you're a split second behind here, split, split second behind there, he's like, you know, you don't have as much at your disposal. So it's just building, building time back in your game, which is, is really important now that it's so fast. I was going to say, um, combine that with a narrower stance with puck on the perimeter. Um, yeah easier to stay ahead of it from that narrow stance because because like you said like you you have a ton of horsepower man i've watched you for years and like you're such a powerful athlete you know on the ice as a goaltender the way you move do you almost have to rein that in and just sort of when the pucks at least especially yeah. on the outside just focus on different things yeah i think for me and like i kind of grew up in the era where you know jonathan quick was you know in, in his heyday you know and I don't know if I was subliminally influenced by that, but I've always like from the get go played like really wide, you know, and been able to cover like distance fairly well, but it really challenged me this year. I really had to strip a lot of my game back and kind of almost like down tune in a way, you know, to play the system. So it was never very easy for me um, this year. I felt like in ways I was always kind of, you know, at that, like at odds with myself, you know, which isn't, you know, always where you want to be, but, um, to stick with it, you know, it, it's important. You know, I think if you've ever talked to Debbie Clarkie, like you have, um, to talk about the development bridge at all. I don't know that we have on this pod. He's, I mean, yeah. me and him have talked about it. I don't know that people have heard it on this podcast, but I mean, so by all means, yeah, go yeah, for it. We, we can kind of elaborate. I mean, the, in summation, it's really, you know, this spectrum, if you will. And, you know, the first few um, ticks on the spectrum are like the introduction of a concept, um, you know, trying it in a controlled environment, adding layers of pace, um, you know, going into an uncontrolled environment with shooters, you know, versus previously, like maybe, um, you know, if you're doing it one-on-one -on -one with Clarkie, he's controlling, you know, the pace and he has the puck. You know, so then the next um, step from that is, you know, with shooters who are trying to score, um, you know, and then you you go to do it in practice and you start to integrate into your practice habits and, you know, maybe you have full integration, you know, and then you have like game emergence after that. And then you have at the end, you know, like seamless integration, like into your game where it pops up more and more consistently, you know, and upon that upon that bridge you know there's times where you know he says it gets windy and it gets really uncomfortable and it's like you know sometimes like we'll go back a couple steps like we'll regress you know because like that doesn't feel comfortable you know so you just want to go back to how you were playing before because you're like well at least i can like you know i know i can make that save that way you know so for me it was a lot of that this year a lot of tug of war you know just battling um old habits and trying to integrate new ones and positive ones, you know, for the rest of my game. And I think, um, ideologically, like it made so much sense to me and I was like, yeah, like, I just want to, 
I want to implement these things. You know, I, I believe in it, but the integration of it is a completely another story. You know, um, it, it's challenging um, within the year too. You know, like you don't practice, you know, a ton in the NHL. You know, so getting every rep that you can and you know garnering that and honoring each rep and trying to you know play that system it makes it even more important you know the emphasis on practice that was another thing i learned too is just like how how on you have to be every day like in in practice but you know that was juxtaposed with me you know like working on stuff that i need to work on you know and it's like well you know i could make these saves you know but like i'm choosing to work on my game you know and that doesn't always you know, appear, you know, to your teammates, like in the best way. So you're trying to, you know, you're trying to feed both wolves, you know, so to speak. I was going to ask you about that in terms of practice and you're trying to be purposeful in new things. And as we know, also in the role practice, you're not always out there for you, right? Right. Like sometimes you're out there and the drills are designed for forwards or defensemen and you're a glorified target. How do you find that line, find that balance where you're competing for them at certain times without abandoning all these new things you're trying to make innate? Yeah. Well, I think really it kind of, you take yourself into a different situation where it's, you know, maybe you imagine, you know, it's late in the game, you know, the score is like pretty tight or whatever You're, you're going into overtime and, you just imagine like that feeling that you have, you know, in that time where you're just super fatigued, you know, and you don't always control the stimulus, you know, you don't control how the puck gets to you. So however you got to stop it, whatever you got to do to just compete, you do, you know, and I think that's something that was, that principle was also really driven home, um, you know, with Crikey too. It's like, Hey, it's an imperfect position, you know, cause it's an imperfect game. So, you know, you can, try and have all this emphasis on your system all you want. But at the end of the day, like when that breaks down, like, who are you, you know, who are you going to be? How are you going to stop that puck? You know? So I think ultimately like that's something that I was able to really not have too much of a regression on is like, cause that's kind of my game, you know, and things are scrambling, just trying to like find something, you know, to get there, throwing a pad up or throwing a, you know, errant stick or arm, you know? So I think, um, that, yeah, that was pretty cool to see, like, just see the growth that, uh, that I was able to, um, achieve, you know, even with, with practice habits. As much as I'm sure everyone would have like in your position would have wanted to come in, have that time and start right in the NHL, given yeah. the learning curve, given how much you were trying to get comfortable with in game action, did it help almost to be starting in the American league this season? And also not just from a, you know, like, like, cause of the practice time, right? Like you're, you're you yeah. should, you do get a little more down there and you're working with Marco who's has some similar concepts. Walk me through how that maybe even benefited you by the time you got up. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Marco and Ian have their own specific ways that they, you know, communicate and, and whatnot. But I think ideologically, they're essentially the same, you know, in the way that they view the game and, you know, the moves to get there, you know, they may differ on a few things here and there, but there was a lot of continuity, you know, between the two of them. So a lot of the same principles that we were addressing in the American league with Marco were, you know, the same ones we were addressing with Clarkie. So it was definitely good to get a little bit more practice time. And it was really just for me, like trying to orient myself and just trying to remember and decide, you know, like, how how am I gonna play this? Like, am I gonna be, you know, that that stubborn, stubborn, you know, old bull that just like does the same thing all the time, you know, or am I gonna really expose myself and open myself up to, you know, some criticism and make mistakes? But, you know, there's maybe more growth to be had um in the end there. And I think that was the decision I had to make um long term. It was a career decision, you know, like I want to play in a different way and you know, the initial phases aren't always what you want them. You know, you have these expectations uh, of performance and you're, you're most battling that with, you know, the new system. So you kind of have to be at ease with that. You know, you have to address that, you know, that, Hey, yeah, I'm going to make mistakes and 
you know, maybe it's not going to look too pretty right away, but you don't have to view, you know, the, the long-term goals as well. I was going to say, it almost sounds like you had to make yourself vulnerable. For sure. No, absolutely. You do. Absolutely. Cause it's not comfortable, you know, like you get used to playing a certain way and, you know, I'd say some, maybe guys older than me wouldn't really, you know, change a whole heck of a lot. Like I didn't really know, uh, Yarrow at all, a lot that is, but you know, he seemed to have his system and I don't really think that there was too much deviation, uh, from his system or integration of like Clarky's, um, you know, teachings, you know, in his style, but I, that's just purely observational. So, um, but Hey, it works for him, you know, but for me, I think I've kind of had a little bit of success early on in my career and then kind of a little bit of a yo-yo. So what I really wanted to do is try and create more consistency in my game. So I kind of had to, you know, regress a little bit, you know, and I think, uh, it's going to pay off. I'm really excited about the work that I'm going to put in this summer. And I just feel more guided in, in the appropriate direction now, you know, whereas before I felt like a little bit misguided, I, you know, you get a lot of different information from goalie coaches or wh- whoever you're training with in the summer, you know, and it's like, okay, I only want to do things that are going to contribute to my game plan and serve my game plan, you know? So like that is a completely different new prerogative than before where it's just like, all right, let's just go out and get a good sweat and, you know, work on some new uh new ways to skate or save the puck and you know i think um there's a time and place for that but uh at this point in my career i feel like i just want to continue to just be so efficient with what i'm feeding myself you know mentally i was gonna say and like physically I mean, as well yeah i mean clark you'd be the first to tell you the game evolves the position evolves but you're coming now it sounds like you've got a very firm foundation so it doesn't mean you ignore everything else but you have right. to see how, how it fits with the game plan as opposed to just trying everything and seeing if you can add it to your game plan yeah yeah no it's interesting i mean i've thought so much about just even like in the beginning days you know i'd take so much home from the rink with me just like principles that we'd be thinking about it's like reverse track it's like well how the heck do i you know, am I going to do that? Like, am I going to go skate on, you know, am I going to go, if I go skate, I'm going to go toe heel, like can my pads close, you know? So like I came home and my wife would be like, you seem like very, you know, very stimulated, you know, with the work that you've been doing. And it was very refreshing, you know, to kind of have that because I don't think I always had that, uh, you know, in Chicago more so in Rockford, maybe a little bit more, but I think, rightfully so like in the american league you have a little bit more time to think about those things and had a pretty close relationship with with peter aubrey um in rockford um and then jimmy jimmy was good too you know it was just different situation different scenario it's funny because you you know it's funny you you mentioned all those things how do i go on post reverse track for those that don't know a lot of people call it a double seal that's where you got to skate on each post um, us beer leaguers can only dream of being able to do that physically, by the way. <laughs> um, that's why we're beer yeah. leaguers. Um, but it's funny because you, you know, you're talking about where on my skate blade do I go? Like I've had those conversations, like in is like top third. Like if you target the top third of your skate, I actually, I can't remember if it's exactly top third, but like, like it's down to where you should, what part of your skate should hit the post. If you're going to go skate on post to give yourself the most margin for error for the ideal situation that level of detail does it make it easier for you to buy into new concepts because he the one thing and i've known Ian since the mid 2000s he introduced me to the game reading his stuff uh editing his stuff for a magazine one thing i always felt like is it was never just do it like this because i said so there was always an explanation did that help you get by him because it came with a reason why uh yes and no like i i think ideologically yeah i i totally bought into that you know from a learning uh perspective and i i respected him because of you know the work that he's done uh prior but then like getting on the ice i was like oh well like yes ideologically like that makes sense but for me i'm i'm such a feel-based person and a repetition-based person and i need to go 
make mistakes and really work on it and break it down and chop it up and, you know, pull coals through it to feel really content with that. So it wasn't enough to be so detailed on his end. Like I actually had to get in the trenches and be like, okay, well, like I try the first third, you know, what if I, you know, maybe go straight half or, you know, the back, like I need to feel what it feels like too. Like I definitely trusted his judgment and his guidance. Um, but that's just the type of learner that I am. I needed to take myself through that, you know, because I had a specific way of playing too, that I liked, you know, uh, for a lot of post-play, I would go, you know, like toe box and stuff. Um, so I really had to get comfortable with going more like skate on post, which I never, I never really believed in before. So I kind of had to have a little bit of faith in, in, the the principle, you know, that he was preaching initially. And then I had to go through it myself multiple times. I was going to say too, and we should be careful here because people will be like, Oh, it's always skate on post. You guys use toe box as well. It's all situational. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But it's, yeah, being definitive in that situation and not varying from that, you know, just because it feels like, or you feel exposed, like you got to go every time toe in a specific situation, or you got to go skate in a specific situation. Again, game plan and a reason for it. Absolutely. Okay. One you touched on that I wanted to to ask you, because this is, especially for a lot of goalies, as we start talking about multiple stance and transitioning out of that higher stance, um, shot preparation, you mentioned it. Um, you know, we, we can see the benefits of a multiple stance system, energy conservation, sight lines when you're in a hot, t- tall, narrow stance in the plays in the perimeter, but getting into your safe stance. And I know there's a step in between with Ian a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. A lot of goalies can like just drop to the point where they lock themselves in. How do you find that balance between being able to manage both without getting caught on the in between? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think for me initially, like if I take it back to the way I had like shot prep before, I think I was early, very soon, you know, and so much happens between the time, you know, the guy decides that he wants to shoot, you know, and that he like the puck gets to you, you know, and you just, I think also I was probably down too soon. So just being more patient on my feet was like the first step and getting comfortable with the timing of like, okay, like, wow, like I'm still on my feet and the puck is like, you know, at the hash marks or whatever, you know, I'm not, not too sure on the the timing of that, but it was super uncomfortable, super uncomfortable because the way I played prior is like, I'd be down early and have that sight line, uh, on the puck, you know, I'd have my, my head down a little bit, you know, so I'm looking out the biggest part of my cage. Um, yeah, but this, so many like screens and tips deflections now that it's like you can't play like that because it's so limiting you know it's very limiting and you have to be content with you know having a narrower stance you know and then if there is no threat you know then you can adjust in a a very timely fashion but if there's like a tip screen whatever like you're going to play that a little differently it's something that we call like air to big that was a huge concept for me too. And it's something that I never really put words to before. It's like probably maybe called it more of a block before. Um, so just changing the nomenclature around a little bit and understanding there's a little, there's a couple of idiosyncrasies, things that are slightly different, but um, yeah, I mean, fundamentally I'd say that was the first item that we chose to correct was you know the shot prep and the multiple stances and just introducing a system of of play for that and i think i was able to make strides to it whereas like now like i'm talking about it i don't even know what i did or i don't even know how i felt doing what i did previously you know where now the feeling that i have with a new system is the only thing that's in my mind air to big i love that like is it just like there i know like you said there are some specifics within that in terms of mechanics or tactics or or technical elements, but even just from a mindset, like blocking feels passive, air to big feels like it. A, it feels Control. it feels right. It's, it sounds big, mm-hmm. and it feels more like you're creating an insurance policy versus being passive. You know what I mean? Like you, you've got yes. a you're building in a safety net versus being passive out there. For sure, and it's like air to big too is so much about timing and. It is 
fundamentally a blocking position, but you still have to be able to react out of that too. And it's like timing your reaction so that you're not over under reacting to the stimulus. So if there's a tip, you know, or deflection, like I'm air to big, but I need to get to my left to make a little elbow save, or I need to get high to make like a bit more of a chicken wing save. Like you have to just have the right timing um, from the get go, but you have to position yourself so that the air to big is effective if that stimulus is removed. Like, so if the tip doesn't, if the puck doesn't get tipped, you know, it goes straight through and hits you. Like, I think that was the hardest thing for me. It was like, okay, like I got to put myself in a good position here with this air to big, where if there's no tip, like I can still get hit with a puck, you know, and I'm, that was really challenging for me. Something I'm still working on. Love it. Okay, listen, I've taken up more time than I said I would already on this call, but I do have to ask one more because that's what I do. But yeah. one of the things we talked about this season and it's stitched into your gear, and I'm I'm now wondering how it fits in with all of this, but I love the be a warrior mantra that you had stitched into the equipment and your Brian's equipment. Yeah. I know there like there it involves a book. So just, I'm just gonna leave like open the floor here. Explain it to me. Explain the mindset. Explain why you have it on your gear as a reminder. I think for me it really was kind of the biggest influence was Patrick Waugh. Um used to write that on his blocker. I remember seeing that one time. And I was like, man, like I really he's a fierce competitor, you know, he wants to win at all costs. And I just thought that was a great little reminder, you know, and everyone thinks it's like, Oh, it's cause you were, went to school at Merrimack and you're the Merrimack warriors. And, you know, maybe no, not necessarily. Um, but I just, you know, I wasn't necessarily like a huge Patrick Waugh fan. I didn't watch him like incessantly or anything, but you know, I, I liked what that represented and how he brought that into his game. You know, you kind of see that he's had that mentality and I'm just doing whatever it took to, to make saves. And, you know, it's just a little bit, a little bit of a reminder, you know, to just, just go out there and compete, I guess. eh? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, like when you strip it all back, like when you go out for a game, you know, you just got to go out there and battle, you know, for your guys and give the team a chance to win at all costs. And I think, you know, there's something to be said for that's kind of how like warriors take care of their business too they just go out there and you know they're just fighting to survive you know <laughs> like fighting to make it to that next next little bit you know and provide so i like that i like what that represents now i'm kicking myself for not getting a picture of it stitched into your gear so the kind of, <laughs> i could have rolled that out for a whole separate story the next time i see you i'm taking a picture of it Colin, Good. this is this was awesome, man. Um, I really appreciate, like I said, early in an off season. I normally don't bug guys this soon, but uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us. I know there are a ton of lessons here that our audience is going to be. They're probably I'm going to probably get ten follow up questions from people that listen to this because there are so many great little pieces of advice, but also things that I think we could probably have entire conversations on. So thank you so much for taking the time for joining us here. Yeah, absolutely. Always, always a pleasure. Thank you. Air to big. See, we we need that Bible of hockey terminology and goalie uh, references. I like it. We do need to add that one. Yeah, I'm on I'm, it. What, I'm, do, what I'm doing it. I actually have a document, guys, where I'm compiling everything because Darren oh, yeah. wants us to have the dictionary. Yeah, I actually shared it with you guys so you could add yourselves, but you guys are not techie. And uh, air to big is going in there. Can you send me a uh, like a, a paper? And I can write it down and then I can carry That's your pigeon tech. That's your back. tech, yeah. 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 Do you even yeah. use a ballpoint pen or are you just pencil? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. Ballpoint pen. Yeah. The 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 pencil I I can't make dark enough to to really uh, jump out at me. So I do need a pen. So you're catching and, up. You're catching yeah, up. Slowly but surely. <laughs> I don't have the duo tang. <laughs> what is that? Woodley's holding up some kind of file. So yes, I use the old double blue software upper hand now to do my goalie tracking and I use clear sight analytics and we have a, a program that Hutch set up where I can, where I can enter data. I think the data set's got over 7,000 goals entered into it in terms of 
you know, all the tracking I've done for the NHL.com playoff project over the years. But at the end of the day, all that information gets printed out and charted and I make notes. And this gigantic duo tank full of like stapled and you can see all the different colors on the uh, the little um, oh paper clips that I've got on there. That's where it all ends up. So technology be damned. I still need to write it all down at the end of the day. Uh, there are literally like 60 pages on Andre Vasilevsky in here, like Carey Price dating back to the you know mid 2015, 2016. Like, yeah. I need to get a little, I'm, as Hutch said, I'm not techie. This would be the ultimate example of not techie. The basic like entire drawer full of notes on goalies over the last six years. Yeah, uh, we noticed when you brought up paper clips that, uh, that you were going the non-technical route. Uh, when, when will your uh, feature that you do every year uh, over at NHL.com on goalie scouting reports uh, be available? As soon as I get off the line with you guys okay. and get my ass in motion. No. Um, second round. We'll have second round previews. We didn't do it in the first round. Uh, just too much stuff, too much information, but we'll have it out on the second round. So um, digging into the numbers right now. And I want to thank you for being on the NHL uh, podcast, uh, The Chirp with Darren Millard. We dove into some goaltending and uh, was was massively received by the audience. And I'm not just uh, saying that because the two of us are on here, but it was it was hugely received. There's this appetite for for goaltending from the the regular uh, segment of the, of the population. So uh, thank you for doing that, and 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 Hutch, thank you for loaning him to me for a couple hours this week. I haven't even seen Woody in a while, so he just keeps doing his thing you don't even know who he is anymore yeah, he's so it's, big time. this is the time of year when his head is down doing his thing but that's what makes him such a genius so love that he's doing it oh darren called me yoda and a guru and now you called me a genius i think we should go back to the uneducated guy sorry i should have said sk- goaltending genius because we know outside of goaltending maybe not so genius but uh he knows his stuff i think yoda's more applicable because i play small in net uh, i think you should get your own t-shirt made that's what you need. Goalie Yoda with Yoda, but with your head on it. See, I don't think, I think they actually call Mitch Korn Goalie Yoda. So I got to be they? really careful here. No, because- I, 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 I'm the one that called you Goalie Yoda. And, yeah, and I'm okay, fine with me. it. I didn't know that. And I'm totally fine with it. It's no offense to Mitch Korn, but I'm going with that phrase. And I do got to be careful here because the reality is everything I learn is because all those guys that are the actual experts, the actual gurus, the actual Yodas share information with me i'm just a reporter who processes it and shares it back so i'm not actually that bright um but i do appreciate you having me on the podcast this week darren i i knew you you're like us it's that time of year where it's hard to get guests no 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 that it must wasn't have been that the, sure you you've you've talked about that you made the the joke on the podcast uh hutch and uh and and give him a a good little shove to to straighten him out but uh we we Really, we're talking about having uh, Woodley on uh, the chirp a, a couple of times this winter when things were happening, and we always uh, got sidetracked. So it was huge, and uh, the producer, producer Bob, w- was all over it. So um, I think it's just there's knowledge there uh, for for forwards, for skaters, for fans, uh, all, all the way around. So uh, it, it was massively appreciated, and your knowledge goes beyond what you say is inside those bones. Well, plus Darren also knew that he could get a whole hour podcast yeah. out of three questions. Yeah. Oh, that, that did come up with producer Bob. He's like, boy, he can talk. You don't know the half of it, man. Wait till he starts <laughs> asking the questions. Wait till we stop recording. Yeah, wait. <laughs> uh, guys, have a great week. Enjoy the start of the second round as we transition into the next step on the Stanley Cup playoffs. Darren, have a great time in the second round. Whether I see you or not in the second round, well, still to be determined. Let's see Seattle. Let's find out what happens and presents itself. And there may be a meeting of the minds, sorry, Pete Fry, coming up between Woodley and Mallard. Hutch, you're welcome to join us anytime if you can fit into that busy schedule of yours. Yeah, that sums it up right there. Uh, thanks for listening on In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by The Hockey Shop, source for sports Langley, thehockeyshop.com. 